So welcome everyone um, to the session on developing your organic system plan, putting it together. Um, Roland Ebel with MSU is going to help facilitate this session. And as are Doug Crabtree, Nate Paul Palm and Judy Oswitz. So maybe the best thing to do this morning, since it's a smaller group, um, we can all introduce ourselves. Um, so Roland, do you wanna just use the list and ask folks to go ahead and introduce themselves? Um, yeah, th uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jamie. And uh, uh, again, welcome everybody to this uh, session, uh, developing and preparing your organic system plan. We have now 10 people in the meeting, I can see. And um, yeah, let's let's do just like a, a, a short initial presentation around. Uh, maybe let's start with uh, the first one I see here on the screen, uh, Doug. Uh. Thank you, Roland. Um, yeah, uh, Doug Crabtree, my, my wife Anna and I own and operate a uh, uh, 9,600 acre organic dryland specialty crop farm, we like to call it, up here on the Canadian border in North, Northern Hill County. Um, previous life, I managed the organic certification program and have a special fondness for organic system plans uh, that I'll, I'll try to share when appropriate. Um, but yeah, I'm here just to be a resource and, and answer any questions and engage in conversation that may be helpful. Thank you very much. And um, just uh, I would like to mention that it would be convenient, convenient if everybody could be muted unless they are, they are speaking so that we don't have any interference here. Uh, the next one I see is uh, Nathaniel. Yep, uh, Nate Palpalm. I'm based out of uh, Bozeman, Belgrade area, and I raised just about um, a thousand acres of pasture, forages, and um, pulse crops, oil seeds, and uh, cereals. Um, so a lot of yellow peas in Durham this year. Um, and I also work with the Montana Department of Ag as an organic inspector and um, currently serve on the National Organic Standards Board. Um, I work with a few other certification agencies, so get to see a lot of OSPs. And so I'm excited to share kind of tips, uh, tips and tricks for how to fill out an OSP so that your inspector um, can get in and out fairly easily um, on your inspection. Well, thank you very much. Well, welcome uh, to the meeting, Nathaniel. And I already look uh, forward to your tips and uh, tricks. Uh, um, next one uh, here is uh, Rich. Could you, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, as Jamie mentioned, Rich Torquemada, and I'm in the, the Bitterroot Valley over, or Bitterroot Valley over near Valley County and between Florence and Stevensville. I have a small uh, vineyard, uh, less than an acre, about 500 plants or so, and uh, I've been operating under that uh, $5,000 limit for uh, certification, so I've been doing it kind of on my own for a number of years, for about six years now. Um, I sell to two wineries currently, and whatever I don't sell, I turn into wine as a hobby. And that's it. Well, uh, th thank you very much. Um, welcome to the meeting. And uh, the next one here is would be Kay. Um, hi, Kay Jorgensen. Um, my husband, Dan, and I farm uh north of guilford so we're actually fairly close to uh doug crabtree i guess comparatively speaking to some of the others um this is our third third year i think certified organic and but i always feel like i try and pick up stuff from these um groups and people and resources and just kind of try and help my husband out he's hauling right now so he couldn't listen but we're going to listen to some of these online later as well and um i'm actually driving in the car so i i might lose you because i don't have necessarily good cell phone service where i'm heading um but i'll pick it up online if i uh the recording if i lose you and um one of the things we're really 
interested in is trying to figure out a way to add the cattle component or grazing. Um, we did some cover crops last year, um, which we were pretty happy with as far as um, contr weed control and not having to do as much tillage. And But we don't have cattle and we don't have fencing. But you know, if somebody wanted to graze for free and put up electric fence, that's what we're kind of maybe looking towards our next step. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very welcome to, to this meeting. And I took note of, uh, of these uh, topics you are interested in. So like mixed farming, adding cattle and also uh, cover crops. Uh, the next one I have on the list would be uh, Judy to introduce herself, please. Hi, I'm Judy Oswitz, and I farm at Terrapin Farm um, north of Whitefish, west of Whitefish. And um, I've got about eight acres uh, certified. That's I've been certifying since sometime the latter part of the last century. <laughs> and um, I've been farming, I think it's 43 years and been certified about 27 of those. Um, I wouldn't do it any other way. I love organics. I believe in organics. I believe in the OSP. The OSP makes me a better farmer. I have uh, unorthodox record keeping methods, but they work. And they, the OSP is just the tip of the iceberg. It's what's behind it. It really makes makes you a good farmer and makes you know you can't you know I've been at it long enough to know I can't remember which year what was where <laughs> so if it's not written down I'm not sure so anyways um, I, I, I like to see new farmers coming on I like to see people integrating different systems into what they're doing bringing in different components be it livestock be it vegetables, be it cover crops, it's all really good. And the, the more we can talk about it, the more we're going to all learn and grow from it. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. Um, welcome uh, to the meeting. And uh, the next one to... Uh, Introduce for a short introduction would be Corey, please. All right, can you hear me? All right. Yep. Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hey, uh, I'm Corey Merrill. My wife and I, Claire Jean, uh, we were farming uh, and cattle uh, over here by Buffalo, Montana, Central Montana. We're in our starting up our fourth season, I guess, of uh, organic. So it's, everything's new to us have a lot to learn. Uh, we're also interested in possibly adding our cattle into the organic mix. We've just done the farming so far and primarily grown barley is, is all we've done so far, but always open to other suggestions, other ideas, what to do. But we are interested in possibly looking at portion of the cattle going organic. So anyway, glad to be here. Thank you. Glad to have you, thank you very much. And two more, uh, Courtney would be next. Hey, thanks Roland. I'm Courtney, I'm here uh, as an agronomy coach uh, out of Glasgow, Montana with 406 Agronomy. I'm kind of here for the exposure, not just for 406, but for me and to kind of get a better understanding of what um, these organic farming systems are like and, and how I could potentially you know, be of assistance in that community, that little niche um, moving forward. So thanks. Thank you for uh, sharing your time with us. And uh, the last one uh, to present himself would be Kevin. Yeah, I'm uh, see first year certified in uh, north of Lewistown, about 20 miles. Um, we did uh, gluten-free oats and uh, hay this year, hoping to expand some stuff, but here to learn. Wonderful, uh, great to have you here. And I see we have uh, uh, just another person joined the meeting, uh, Julie. 
could you pres uh, could you present yourself, please? Maybe, maybe later. Um, well, I would say let's get uh, let's get right into the uh, discussion now. Uh, so uh, we don't have like a, a, a formal presentation, but as as we have already heard, so uh, Nathaniel has a lot of knowledge and expertise uh, to share with the group, and uh, I would like to invite you to share some of your uh, experience. Sure, yeah. So I was thinking um, we, I was originally going to tackle this with Margaret Scholes, who has probably seen more OSBs than anybody else on this earth, but uh, she wasn't able to join us. So the plan that we had uh, crafted was just to go through a sample OSP that I had written up um, and just highlight some of the areas for different types of producers, produce, grains, cattle, um, different areas that you can focus on that sometimes get overlooked. Um, and then as we go, if anyone has any questions about um, a question on the OSP that they've seen, that they're curious about, that they would like some more interpretation for how to better answer it, just interrupt me and we can have a discussion. So I am just going to share my screen real quick. Let me see if this works. All right, is that showing up all right, Jamie? Yep, it looks good, Nate, thanks. Perfect. All right. And I'm just going to full screen it. And okay. And bear with me just one second. Um, one moment. I will be right back. I'm going to jump in here. Um, Julie, did you want to introduce yourself? Roland, while we're waiting, maybe you could tell us uh, your uh, position and background. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, very briefly, because I saw, I saw that Nathaniel is, is already back here, but I'm uh, uh, just recently appointed as a research professor here at uh, Montana State University. Um, I'm in the field of uh, sustainable food systems, and I know that the SFS program is, has actually uh, done a lot of uh, collaborations with uh, you there at the at the at the Grab Tree Tree Farm. So I, I had, haven't had the opportunity yet to to visit your farm, but I look uh, forward to doing so uh, one day. And uh, so my expertise is in agroecology, uh, particularly in uh, horticultural crop management everything which is related to sustainable fertilization measures in a yeah in, in, in a in a very broad way and we just recently got a grant from EPA which is about the um, uh, an anaerobic digestion of uh, household food scraps which we will be implementing with uh, 12 households here in Bozeman so this is like the next uh, big project I will be uh, working on and uh, yeah, I'm I'm always like eager to 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 knowing um, what's going on in the in the organic co uh, community and uh, joined uh, MOA last year and I, yeah, I, I'm pleased to, uh, in the first place to to learn from all of you from from your experiences and uh, yeah, that's about me and now let's get back to uh, Nathaniel, please. Super. Well, thank you so much for that, Roland. Um, all right. Well, I was just going to go through basically um, for anyone who hasn't filled out an OSP. Um, I'm looking at the Montana Department of Ag uh, Certification um, Programs OSP. This is one that's probably most commonly used in Montana for those folks certified by MTDA. Um, when going through the, the, the goal of the OSP, of course, is to allow the certifier and the inspector to get a clear idea of what goes on on your farm and how you can reasonably uh, expect to produce um, under the organic standards. And so in these first pages, we're just trying to get a brief summation of what um, crops you raise, what activities you um, run. And um, this is a living document. And this is sort of when the Montana Department of Ag, I think is one of the cooler programs because they just basically wipe the inspection report off every year, but fundamentally this stays the same as you work through it year after year. Um, 
And so identifying um, that we are familiar with the organic standards, this is actually part of the rule that the producer has to, we have to confirm that producers are familiar with the organic standards. So that's why we ask. Um, and that just means that you've seen a copy, you have access to where the rule actually is housed. Um, and then a brief description of your operation. And this is where I as an inspector often go just to get an idea of when I'm doing an initial review, what does this farm produce? What kind of operation do they run? For this example, we're talking about a range of things, but small grains, pulse crops, forages, um, some chickens, some beef cows. And um, I did do a little bit of vegetable production back in the day. That's less of what I do now. And this isn't showing up quite as cleanly. Okay, let's try, oh. I might have to unfull screen it. Sorry, everybody. Let's see if we can, I think that should still work. Does that look all right, Jamie? Okay, cool. Um, so for new applicants, if you're coming through um, as a new applicant, have not been certified before, you're gonna fill out this second component. Um, look, if you're a, a producer who's transferring from a different certifier, if you've been certified, but wanna switch over to Montana Department of Ag, then you're gonna be filling out this number two box. Um, on the whole, if you're fresh to organics, you're gonna uh, just fill out all of this. Um, and pretty much the biggest thing is collecting land information here. And this is that's a couple of attachments that we won't go over right this second, but ultimately to, to have land um, considered for organic certification, we need to know what was put on it for the past three years and have a good set of maps so that we can locate it and understand um, the respective uh, risk to that piece of property. Um, so filling out that land application and then making sure that we have a good set of maps. I really like using Google, Google Earth just to take screenshots of the fields. Um, I don't know if, uh, how have you found best to, to acquire and use maps, Doug? Well, um, I'm a bit old school myself. So way back when, uh, when, when we sort of started, I, I created a set of field maps um, using Excel. And I still use that format today as our primary presentation. Uh, sometimes supplement that with the FSA maps that I find really useful in terms of verifying acres and, and crops. Um, I'm not as into the Google thing. I, I've done it, but uh, I, I'm not as handy with that. So we kind of stick to the ones that I know how to edit. And I, I do a lot of editing. Well, and I think that's a great point. Montana in a, in a real way kind of lucks out on the map front since if you are involved in FSA, you're already going to have a set of maps that you're working with. And those are perfectly usable to just hand right over to the organic program. Um, and usually they're marked up pretty well to identify what we're doing. The biggest thing on maps, which we talked about a bit yesterday, is that we wanna know what the, um, the neighboring field activity is surrounding the field to identify what sort of buffers we should be looking for as inspectors and certifiers. Um, international markets, this is typically filled out once, but the, the big question is not necessarily, are you going to be exporting your crops or goods, but are your customers going to be exporting? Um, and so if you're raising grain, lots of times you have uh, buyers who are planning to ship to Europe, Canada, uh, Japan, and with grain in Montana, at least, it's actually quite simple. The only um, thing we need to be considering is if you use a fertilizer, does it contain sodium nitrate? Sodium nitrate is a, um, a naturally occurring um, form of nitrate, but it's not actually allowed in Canadian organics or European organics. Um, and so that's why we check for that. Um, if you don't use any fertilizers, but crop rotation and cattle manure, then we can check no, and that basically confirms the eligibility for export. So this is something that we that is more broad. Um, if you're a vegetable producer, probably not going to be exporting anything, um, but never know. Yeah. i just jump in there, Nate. I, I think it's unlikely that many of us as producers are going to know. And so my advice is check all the boxes and get certified for anything and everything you qualify for so you can keep your marketing options open and uh, the inspector can help sort out if there are any, uh, any limitations on that when they get to your farm. And as you said, for most of us in the uh, field crop business, uh, we're not doing things that, that are problematic anyhow. 
Exactly. Oh, yep. I'd like to jump in really quick. We grow a fair bit of seed and it does get exported by our seed buyers. And the first year that um, they wanted export certificates for this um, export certification for the seeds, the, um, the department was very accommodating in jumping in afterwards and making changes that needed to be made. Totally. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. An excellent point. So it does really apply to, could apply to really everybody who grows anything in Montana um, and the country. Um, be the, the, being on the front end of trying to capture these, um, these eligibilities on your certificate just means that you'll be able to move more quickly when you get, when you get a buyer and they want to put your, your uh, products on a truck. Um, but as, as Jody said, we do really try to try to make, make it rain when we have folks who need certificates and need to get things moving. Um, in, in these descriptions, and I'm excited to talk about this today because I know we talked about the anatomy of an OSB yesterday, but in these descriptions, we have a lot of options for giving you the chance to describe via checkboxes what your growing practices are. And so for each of these sections, this is a component directly relating to the National Organic Program standards. Um, and so we want you to pretty much give us anything that you're actively doing. Um, and so if you make compost tea, use cover crops, crop rotations, um, checking all of those boxes and then what I or another inspector does when we visit your farm for the inspection is we'll go through and actually check those um, practices, see how they're incorporated, kind of get the finer details of the story. But overall putting anything that you actually do up here um, is the goal so we can understand does this system work? Um, if you're not checking crop rotation, and this is one that sort of always surprises me, but if you're not checking crop rotation for fertility, I always sort of wonder how you're keeping your fertility up because it's very expensive to put manure on every acre to the point that you can keep your crop qualities up. Um, what do you primarily use for fertility, Judy? We do use manure selectively because we don't have livestock, so we do bring in manure, but um, we do a really strong crop rotation. Absolutely. And, and I think that's... incorporate a lot of legumes, and then we do a lot of cover cropping, um, both with um, uh, organic matter, as in buckwheat, and um, uh, nitrogen fixers, as in winter peas. Awesome. And I think that's going to be pretty common throughout both vegetables and grain across the board. Um, cover crops and green manures in vineyards as well, I think is one of the more common ways to maintain fertility. Um, noting on this second box, the, any, any information you have on what you know about your soils. So if there's deficient nutrients, um, how you manage your, whatever management, uh, components go into your, uh, your soil maintenance, um, and so when we're going through these boxes, um, when you're looking at how, when you manage your fields via crop rotation or tillage, what are you managing for and, and what are you maintaining uh, and protecting? And so if we're looking at managing for deficient nutrients, which is often the case that we're trying to keep nitrogen levels up, if we're looking to raise uh, high protein grains, um, maintaining overall bi biodiversity, some folks are amending for pH. That's a little less common, I think, here than, than say in the Midwest where they struggle more with um, acidic soils. Soil compacting, soil crusting, all of these are, are challenges that we'll experience in any farming system. So we're just looking at what are your practices for addressing those and which ones are you specifically focusing on? Um, where I'm at wind erosion down in the Gallatin Valley, wind erosion just isn't really that common. Um, and so my pressures would be probably more on things like uh, nutrient deficiencies, compaction, uh, water availability. Um, so it's gonna be pretty specific to your context in, in the farm that you operate. Um, practices that monitor for the effectiveness. These again are going to be, how do you actually check in that your program is working? How are you maintaining your, your soil fertility, your soil structure? Um, typically it's going to be observation-based. And so as an inspector, I would just be looking at what records do you keep um, throughout the year via, via on your calendar, in your phone, in a notebook. Um, any, any tips or tricks, Doug, for 
how you keep active uh, records in the heat of the season? Um, a good staff, uh, I guess, is the shortest answer. But I, I do want to encourage, um, you know, there's a, there is an organic standard that, that uh, we all need to comply with that says we will maintain or improve soil organic matter. And I've never understood how anyone could meet that standard without testing for it periodically. So um, I, I think it's important that that be one of the analytical tests that, that any farm conducts with uh, some regularity. We, we try to do at least once within a rotation cycle. And uh, just, uh, it, it's, it's, to my understanding, impossible to know if you don't, if you don't check that. Um, so I definitely encourage, you know, we, we do a, a fair bit of soil testing, a, a little bit of, of crop uh, plant tissue testing and, uh, and also some um, soil biological uh, analyses that we're, we're working on. So um, the, the more information you have, the better you know how well the system's working. Absolutely, no, thank you for that. I think that we luck out when we get settlement sheets from our buyers and often we sell crops based on quality. So that can be a bit of an indicator, but I think to Doug's point, soil testing can really highlight if you have an impending problem. Um, if your nitrogen levels are really dropping in your soil, you're gonna be running into quality issues and in, in plant health pretty quickly that's going to be uh, you know something that's a lot harder to correct once it's gone over the edge of being too low. Um, so we really want to try to avoid mining soil and and use that cover crop and in, in soil amendments to address that. But thank you for that Doug that's that's huge. Um, noting how often you do each practice if you're soil testing every year you would just be clicking yearly. Um, if you're doing plant tissue tests throughout the season, which some folks do depending on crops, it might be a little bit more frequent. Um, as needed, will we'll more reflect kind of larger um, macro observations. So identifying, you know, if we, if we run into a bit of a problem or if we're doing it based on, um, based on agronomist advice, um, that might be another component of, of when, when we're, we're considering doing these tests and observations. Noting how you keep your records, um, I think a lot of us could check electronic in some form these days, um, whether it's notes in your phone, text to each other from the tractor to the field, um, anything that you do to keep track of your, your respective records, you wanna just note, and then those are the records we're gonna review during the inspection, um, just to go over so we know where to look. Um, the cool thing about this form is that the inspector goes through and pretty much looks at your OSP, reviews your records in your farm, and then writes their report directly into the form. Um, so it's one of the more streamlined report forms that I've seen and, uh, and helps capture and keep this OSP up to date. Crop rotation to Doug's point of uh, 205, 205, which is the section in the standard and 205, 203, that we should be building soil. And so looking at this crop rotation, I think it's a really exciting spot to identify what is what do we use crop rotation for and how are we addressing and maintaining that standard? So in describing your, um, your crop rotation, my sort of uh, assumption of the anatomy of one of these descriptions is that you're gonna list what types of crops you raise and in what order. It doesn't necessarily have to be the specific type of wheat that you're gonna raise year over year, um, but also what does it do? Um, and so when you're raising uh, wheat and peas and alfalfa in a rotation, you're fundamentally going to be fixing nitrogen. You're going to be limiting the pest cycle that could be attacking your wheat um, and ultimately making, making your nutrition or your nutrient level in the soils increase, thus making it so your cash crops can maintain their qualities. So trying to get a little bit of a narrative, it's not the greatest place because it doesn't um, expand this form, but writing as much as you can and then we can scroll through it. Um, and being as, as detailed as possible. I know uh, I've worked with Doug on his inspection and he gives a great narrative about what's, what's the point of his crop rotation and how is he monitoring it. Um, and I, I see that across the board that folks are really paying attention. I think it helps us um, identify where we should spend our time and focus a little bit better as inspectors when we know what your goals are for your crop rotation and how you're maintaining them. 
Um, the sequence, so I usually am going to have some sort of spring grain, um, depending on what I interplanted. Um, and then I might the following year go into a, a pulse and then back to some sort of spring annual. Of course, the goal being that we're giving enough time to break up pest cycles, break up weed cycles, um, suppress weeds as best we can with this rotation. Um, noting any major soil deficiencies on your farm. If, you've, if you're coming into a really hard run farm that's, that's had a lot of nutrients mined, you're probably gonna be in more of a regenerative um, phase trying to build those nutrients up. So noting those, because then we can also help you check for, um, is this operation effectively managing those, those nutrients? Um, noting tillage practices, this is gonna range, obviously there's dozens and dozens of different tillage tools. Um, our goal, of course, is to identify, are we tilling in, in accordance with that 205, 205 standard, the um, maintaining and improving our, our soil? And so looking at how do we minimize till, um, if we practice no till, that's awesome. I haven't seen very much of that, but I think in some contexts it might be uh, possible and appropriate. Um, permanent cover, contour farming, all of these are just sort of descriptors that we want to get a sense of what conservation practices are you planning on doing in your organic system. Um, identifying the equipment, and so pretty much checking off just everything on your, on your place um, and, and noting um, when we get there, then we can confirm and update anything that you've changed from the, the inventory of equipment you have. Manure is one that trips folks up and I often find myself correcting. The, the trick with manure, and this is the chief difference is between produce and grain. If you um, apply your manure prior to seeding in a grain operation, you're never going to be out of compliance because you're never going to have a crop that is ready to go and ready to harvest, usually less than 90 days after that application date. Um, so we have at least 90 days um, of a harvest window between application if we, if we apply it before planting. Um, and so when you're looking at this, it is also really focusing in on human foods intended for human consumption. And so if you're just raising hay, the manure standard really doesn't apply. Um, and if you're raising vegetables, we need to be a little bit more careful because we, when we look at crops that touch the ground, um, we have to look at uh, at least 120 day period between the last uh, manure application and the date of harvest. Most folks use manure. There's not a, not a ton of true composting um, going on. And by true composting, it's where we actually monitor the temperatures to which the compost pile reaches and um, comply with a certain number of turns in the compost. compost. Oh. Someone have a, something to throw in there? Damn, I've just got some feedback. Um, do you use compost, Judy? We do not use composted manure. We don't really have the ability to create it mm -hmm. um, to the specifications that the, um, that the uh, NOP requires. Um, we, but I, I do look at manure as a big tool and just look at either fall applications in, in areas which are going to be early crops um, that are, need to be 120 days that are contact crops or spring application for crops that can be later and upright crops like corn. Absolutely. That is the key. So if you're raising anything that touches the ground, potatoes, squash, um, beets, anything that would be in the soil, that's going to be 120 day uh, harvest window when you have to apply the manure 120 days before that harvest. If it's something that doesn't touch the ground, like corn or any of the field crops, wheat, pulses, those are going to be 90 days. Um, lots of folks have that cattle integration, and so manure applied by grazing. Again, if you remove your cows before you seed, you're going to be totally fine. Um, Identify what your grazing periods are. This just basically highlights that we're going to be grazing in the fall and winter on our crop ground. And so if we're off by January, we are going to have until the following August as a, as a window um, to see that manure burn off and, and not pose a uh, food safety issue. Um, 
if you buy in manure, I know I, I work with some of my local dairies to bring on manure. And so I just have them submit uh, to me a signed affidavit confirming that they don't use any um, deodorants or other manure treatments. If you're using, if you're next to a feedlot or possibly bringing in chicken manure, just getting a similar um, confirmation is going to be key. Uh, but otherwise, we don't need, we can use conventional manure in organics. Um, it's just making sure that it's not treated or containing a prohibited substance. When we talk about compost, if we do make compost or you do want to use compost, um, and and really the the point of using compost is if you need to apply a, fer a fertility uh, treatment within that 90 or 120 day window, depending on your crop. So if you need to side dress uh, an existing crop and that's going to put you within that window, compost doesn't have that timeline requirement because it's considered neutral. Um, because of the, the temperature requirements, it's going to have burned off most of the, um, the, the potentially foodborne pathogens and, and microbes. All right. Any questions from, from anyone else right now? Anything in the chat box, Jamie? Yeah, so there was a comment from um, Doug uh, about no-till and, and the, the difficulties it, it uh, the no-till management creates for, for uh, organic farmers. Maybe you can uh, explore this part a, a little bit. Sure. Uh, Doug, if you want to give, give me a, a synopsis of, of the focus, it's a big, big topic. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting me step on my soapbox. Um, I, oh. I'll just share my own bias. I, I think no-till is a perversion of farming, but uh, it's particularly in an organic setting. If someone indicates they're not using tillage at any kind of a scale, that to me is a huge red flag because uh, it is it is practically impossible to, to practice that without reliance on prohibited substances for both fertility and uh, weed and pest control. Uh, so that that would be a huge red flag. And then from a more practical standpoint, I, I do not see any um, evidence that, that no-till can successfully meet the, uh, the soil management, um, you know, soil building requirements of an organic system. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's something we should be discouraging uh, extremely and, uh, and looking for more appropriate methods of production. Definitely. I think for this one, in my experience with the Montana producers, um, it's often a, a, a mis either a mistake when it's checked, but the more appropriate time that I see it is if you have a wild grass hay operation um, where you're just bailing off old CRP or, or a native prairie type scenario um, and essentially farming what you would. Um, otherwise, ranches, I think also would be, because you're managing pasture as a crop, that would be also an opportunity when you might say you're doing no-till. Yeah, well, um, we can have perennial phases within the rotation where that may apply. Um, just, it, it should definitely lead to more explanation. Definitely, yes. No, no, thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, and if you're a grain crop or even a vegetable, I mean, definitely a vegetable crop, Likelihood, this would just be not applicable to to your check boxes because um, there's going to be some sort of soil disruption. Um, but I see folks check this kind of aspirationally because they think no-till is the way to go and that's what they're looking to do. But try to be as accurate as you can of what you actually do on your farm. Um, and that way we don't have to make as many updates to the OSP when we see the practices in person on site. Nathaniel, I have, I have a question just, just for interest. I hope it's not boring for the others, but uh, I, did, uh, um, I did organic farming back in, in Europe. And there the, the rule is that you can do tillage using a, a cultivator or a gr grabber, but you are not allowed to use a plow. Is, is it the same rule here in the, in the US? No. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so it is, it is much more, I would say, cultural in the US about what sort of tillage tools one uses. Um, the plow was used very heavily and inappropriately, um, you know, in the 1930s. And so we had the Dust Bowl and it created this really anti-plow fervor and ultimately sort of led us to this, what Doug's describing this um, chemical heavy no-till. 
I personally really think a plow is an integral tool um, in organics. And, and it, it is one of the only effective ways I found to manage with tillage thistles. Um, and so there's not a prescription from the standards as to what tools you can or cannot use. All we really look to is, are you building soil under that 205, 205 component of the, of the standards? Um, and so if there's evidence, ever evidence of erosion or any sort of soil degradation from any of the tillage practices, that goes in as a non-compliance um, from the certifier and can, and can lead to certification being lost. Um, but if we see someone saying, you know, mold board every year, twice a year, it would definitely lead to more questions because we'd be asking what is the most appropriate tillage for your situation? And, and is it trying to, you know, both manage soil conservation while also effectively managing weeds and pests and everything? And so where, um, I didn't catch, which um, country did you farm in? Uh, in uh, Austria. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you would speak to that too, Doug. I am controversially a, a big a, a fan of the mold board um, in, the right, in the right circumstances. I think it does have a place on the farm. Um, and I think it's just a matter of making sure that we use it judiciously. Yeah, absolutely. I, I consider myself a defender of the plow <laughs> in general. Uh, uh, we find that there are places, as you suggested, within the rotation and certain circumstances where that is absolutely the proper tool to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't know how to, to adequately feed my soil if I didn't have access to that tool in particular at the right time. I'm, I'm really surprised to hear that from, from Austria because I've, I've done a, a a lot of uh, uh, learning from systems in Europe and uh, uh, where I've, I've gathered a lot of, uh, you know, information on the appropriate use of tillage in uh, organic and biodynamic systems. And uh, a lot of the long-term research coming out of uh, uh, England and, and Europe is, is very supportive of appropriate tillage. So, um, I'm I'm rather disturbed to hear that they've got a there may be a standard there that's that's limiting our access to those tools. Well, I was gonna I was gonna say Lem, Lemkin is one of my favorite companies, and I think it's a German plowmaker. Indeed, um, I think it's very important to know we have these tools, and they are just that they are tools, and yep. we need to use them appropriately. There, there you can cross the line into overuse very easily with many tools. You know, we don't have a mold board. We use a disc or AKA disc plow. We call it a disc, but it's a disc plow. But um, uh, I can't imagine farming without it. It depends a lot on the, on the soils you are dealing with, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And that's a huge thing. I know like where, where I'm at, like I was saying in the Gallatin Valley, I have a lot more heavy loamy soils and I also don't have wind erosion. There, I'm protected by mountains and, and trees. Um, and so in that context, oftentimes I can, I can um, not worry about using a plow um, and, and do so as long as I'm making sure I'm trying to keep that soil covered as best I can with cover crops and everything um, and leaving a good amount of, of biomass on top of the soil. Um, if you're in a really sandy soil and you have exposure to a lot of wind, a plow would be something that you'd want to really consider how to protect your soil. You still might need to use it, but making sure that we're in the context of our soils using the appropriate tools. But thank you for that question. That's, that's huge. Um, I want to make sure that everyone that's um, newer to this um, has a chance to ask any questions about maybe some practices that are specific for their operations. Yes, please we want to jump in. And we learn from all sorts of different circumstances. So well, I was going to ask about the vineyards. What do you use for um, crop rotation and uh, and soil fertility? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, of course, they're perennial row crops in, in essence. And so I don't rotate my grapes. Uh, um, I'm just going to start next year using cover crop for re weed control. Right. Um, I do a shallow 
a shallow till on on weeds between the vineyard rows and i use um right now wood chip mulch and hand weed pulling and just a lot of things solarization burning uh for control of weeds but for nutrients um you know i i've been using uh feather meal organic feather meal uh mm -hmm. incorporated around the vines themselves by, by hand and uh that's about it. I'm not, uh, I could use more nitrogen, but essentially my soils um, are okay enough. And grapes are one of those products where if if they're stressed a little, um, some say you get even a better quality of juice for winemaking. For sure, yeah. Um, I've done quite a few inspections of grapes over in, in Napa Valley and, um, and they've, I think, done a, seen some pretty awesome progressive rotations. Like you said, the vines themselves aren't rotating, but incorporating things like pulses and uh, annual plow downs into those, those alleyways between the vines um, to try to keep that soil, man actively manage those alleyways um, as a means of, of improving that soil. Right. That, that's I awesome. would have a comment for you, and that would be to be wary of burning for um, weed control. Uh, because there is some s rather uh, specifics in the regulations about that. Yes. So to that, and I think we're, we're getting to it near, we're not allowed to burn crop residue um, or residue. And so I raise flax and it leaves a pile of straw that's really hard to incorporate. And so a lot of folks on the conventional side will burn it off. That's prohibited in um, organics. We can suppress weeds um, and suppress germination of weed seeds. Um, but the goal is to not basically to limit the amount of carbon we're shooting into the atmosphere in an organic system. So when we're burning, just trying to think of, um, is the heat killing you know, a, a pre-germinating seed or otherwise a small weed um, pressure? Um, and not that we're just burning off stubble and crop residue. I had a um, question. Oh yeah. I'm sorry, this is Craig Schmidt. I um, I'm newer, a little bit newer to the organic, uh, you know, rotations and such, but uh, are any people using um, organic fertilizers of any kind to get their ground started, you know, things started, you know, biologically? In some ways, um, lots of times I have, I've had a lot of different companies contact me um, sort of asking, they have an existing product portfolio and they're interested in how to, how it might be incorporated into organic system. And I have just honestly never found a better jumpstart to soils than doing a good cover crop, a good diverse cover crop, um, because you're going to be activating a lot of the sort of, um, the, uh, ambient, um, uh, micro communities in the soil. Um, and so some folks might do an injection of a fish emulsion, a feather meal. Um, there are specifically sort of what they call biological um, uh, inoculants, improving that, that uh, fungal to biological ratio. Those, um, I think they have a place, and especially if you have really hard beaten soils that might've been farmed in a monocrop of the same crop, you know, wheat on wheat, um, those can help, but I, th I really, if you're able to get just a good cover crop, even for a plow down in there, I haven't seen anything jumpstart a field quite like that. How, what would you say to that, um, Doug? Well, you're a lot more diplomatic than I am, a, um, <laughs> not being an inspector any longer or, or working for the certifier. I'll just be very frank. Um, in, in a dry land, kind of a, a low uh, intensity system, such as uh, since as we manage, we don't see any place for off-farm purchased inputs beyond the uh, the neighbor's uh, manure, and uh, we'd like to get away from that and get get to, to moving towards making our our own through grazing and, and livestock. But uh, the solutions in a bag are really helpful to the people that are selling them, and not very helpful to those of us that that are growing. Uh, they're shortcuts at best. So look within. Um, you, know, you, you need to focus on trying to make your system self-sufficient to the greatest extent possible and uh, um, money and time spent on, on off-farm inputs is better spent on the farm uh, with your, your boots in the soil. 
Yeah, I think that's what the, the goal. I was just asking if anybody else has been doing that or if that's a prominent thing. And if you're doing cover crotch, which I'm a total believer and I had some success on some acres with that, um, but is that uh, when you're just getting started, uh, growing a cover crop, getting it implemented, getting nitrogen and all the other things in the soil takes time and you need to actually make money each year. Sure, so I'd, I'd there, say but... uh, for that, it, for me, it really depends on kind of what sort of land you're running. So on dry land operations, I haven't come across a lot of examples of cost-effective nitrogen importation. You can bring on pelletized chicken manure, you can bring on um, pelletized feather meal and things like that. And they definitely are, you know, much like you would with a, a more conventional system. They're going to bump your soil nitrogen in the short term so that crop can, eat, can take it up. Um, the the respective cost per acre i think has left most of the producers that i've seen use those products pretty much at a wash um compared to what they're then able to realize from revenue from that input and by that i mean if you're raising a, a possibly lower quality wheat or barley um that might be going for feed rather than food um but or, or rather than malt um because you don't necessarily have the the nitrogen up I haven't seen anyone able to really remedy that in a dry land system. In irrigated systems, I can't remember, Craig, do you, are you dry land? Um, I have mostly dry land, but I have some irrigated. Okay, so in irrigated, I think that there is, there's often much more of a place just because you're able to get much higher yields per acre. And so when you're putting in your inputs on the irrigated operation, um, you can just realize more units of production per acre, which might then make it so that you're not spreading so much over so many acres. Um, but I think I have never found something as good as manure. Um, and so I think any of these more processed products are gonna be, uh, they, they are maybe more um, direct in their ability to boost plant available nutrients. But I think as far as feeding your soil, which is going to result in longer term benefits um, and more a more resilient soil that's gonna produce higher quality crops, I've just never found anything better than, than crop rotation and in animal manure, chicken or cattle really. They're, they're both great materials. Mm -hmm. And so if you can winter a bunch of cows on your property, I think that is every everyone's dream because it's going to be the least amount of labor and everyone wins. So I'm excited to hear about the folks interested in the cattle integration. Um, Cause that is, I think for, for me, I've seen that as being the, the best way to, to effectively bring on nutrients and cycle nutrients to, to boost your crops. So on that, on that point, actually, and I, and I am doing that, my neighbor does cattle. So I'm definitely mm -hmm. going to put cattle on my ground, but uh, it's a, uh, is, have most people letting someone else put cattle on the ground? I know I've talked to Doug and he's got his uh, guy starting, you know, his little own operation doing it, but what are most organic farmers doing? Do they do cattle and grain farming? It's, it's a lot of extra stuff. Yeah, I'd say there's a real, I mean, Montana's great in, in that there's a lot of integrated farms. A lot of grain farms do have cattle and so they can have their own operations. Um, I think in, in some respects, there's also a lot of operations that just focus on one or the other. And so creating those partnerships where you offer opportunities for grazers to come on, they're going to appreciate the feed. And, and I think we as crop producers are going to really appreciate that fertility. Um, and so I see a lot of cooperative relationships where folks will plant cover crops and then either charge or just give away for free that grazing in return for the manure that's left. I'm going to jump in here quick. Um, Moa has had a series of discussions on meat processing that has included ranchers. And I do know that there is interest from um, non-organic ranchers in finding fields for grazing. So I think there's definitely more interest. Um, it's tough to maybe find the right fit, but you know, I, I think we're a creative bunch and, and can get things together. Uh, Cole Mannix would be a good person to talk to about that. Definitely. Um, so just a little on seed. So looking at um, when we go to source seed, of course, we need to first look at if we have certified organic seed available to purchase. That's what we need to purchase. The exception being if we can't find any certified organic of the variety um, that we're looking for, then we can purchase non-organic, non-treated. Um, we have to do a seed search where we look at three different suppliers of organic seed. 
Um, and if they all come back and say they don't carry the variety we're looking for, then we can proceed with purchasing a non-organic variety. So noting that, um, noting, keeping a good record of who you check with. Um, and so here I noted the different seed suppliers I might look at um, when, when trying to find, they all sell some form of organic seed. So we know that they at least have the channels to source organic seed. And if they don't have any, then, um, then I could proceed with purchasing non-organic seed and keeping track of that. When you purchase non-organic seed, be sure to keep the tags and receipts um, and get an attestation from your seed supplier that it was a non-treated form. I'd like to jump here on my soapbox for just a moment. Absolutely. Um, it's encouraged that we expand our numbers of places we are looking at seed. So if you have three the same this year as three the same last year, go beyond those three and look elsewhere for it. And um, we also encourage growing seed. And I, I feel it's a huge responsibility and a privilege for each farmer to, to grow, pick and choose the, the, what does well for them. Pick your, pick your best seed, pick your best spot um, and replant it. Absolutely. It's, it's, that way you and know I, it's organic. I think one of, again, I, I, I'm glad I'm in Montana because I always come across as deeply biased towards Montana and saying how Montana is the best, but also because we raise cereals and pulse crops, most of the time we can be saving our own seed. We don't raise hybrid crops that need to be from two purebred parent lines like corn or soybeans, um, mostly corn. And so when we're uh, looking at developing, you have developing our, our seed resources, I think to Judy's point, feeling comfortable of bringing on a mobile seed cleaner or sending our seed off to be cleaned, huge benefit, both from a cost point of view, but also from increasing the amount of organic seed that we can be using in our systems. Um, and not only is it organic, it's grown in the climate that you want it to be from. Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing better than a seed that's actually adapted to your farm. And that's what I think is, is to our benefit to all be striving towards just from pure, purely dollars and cents that seed's going to do better. Um, we don't have a lot of genetically modified seeds um, that are applicable to Montana production. Um, of course, we'd be looking at alfalfa, corn, um, some squashes, and that would be the majority of potentially GMO. When we go to buy seed, um, we need to be making sure that we're not buying any GMO seed um, that is a, a strictly prohibited. We can't ever use GMO in our organic production and we can't use GMO on our transitional ground. And so if you're looking at transitioning ground, growing cover crops, putting in some alfalfa, you still want to make sure that that seed is non-GMO if you're going to be using non-organic seed. Um, we do inoculate, of course, all of our pulse crops, all of our legumes, and so making sure that the inoculant is um, a, an approved material. And so when you're going to buy your inoculant, checking in with your certifier to identify and confirm um, what your inoculant is and that it's approved um, is something you're going to want to definitely do before mixing it in with your seed um, and putting it in the ground. So vegetable, um, th this is uh, going to be if we're in the fruit or herbs or annual um, and perennial um, produce business, where the, the most specific component of this is in addition to seeds, if we're using seed, seedlings or seed stock, um, they're going to have to be certified organic. So if we're purchasing um, or perennial planting stock, um, then those are going to have to be uh, treated as organic for a year prior to harvesting. So if we're putting in fruit trees um, or grapes, um, usually it's not a problem because mostly they don't yield in the first year, but um, we want to make sure that we have confirmation that they were themselves not treated when we put them in the ground and that then we have that year delay between planting them and harvesting them. So they're managed organically for a year prior to taking organic fruit. Um, a lot of produce growers are going to have a high tunnel um, and possibly some sort of greenhouse. And so going through this, we want to identify what activities are we expecting to occur? Um, are we just basically starting seeds and then putting them in the high wind tunnel? Are we starting seeds and then moving them out to the field? Um, are we, the a big component of this is, are we growing in soil exclusively or do we have any hydroponic production here? 
Um, that's less common in Montana and less common in Montana organics, but uh, it is a practice that is currently allowed under um, the organic standards. And so filling this out um, in, in anticipation of what sort of greenhouse or high tunnel activities you expect to have is gonna be helpful for us knowing what we're to be expecting as inspectors when we get on the, on the property. Um, treated wood is prohibited as a new application in organics. And so if we're building a structure, we need to make sure that any treated wood used is either one, ideally not used, but two, doesn't come in contact with the soil that we're expecting or hoping to have certified as organic. And here we would incorporate all of our seeds used the uh, seed the, for non-organic seeds. If we have organic seeds, we're going to just list them and we want to make sure that we have a certificate with them. Um, non-organic seeds, we want a little bit more information noting what the crop was, what the variety was and where we got it, as well as any treatments that we put on it. So here we have um, some yellow peas. This is the, the provider. Um, and then we put some cell tech inoculant on it, um, making sure that that was verified as approved with our certifier prior to, um, to using it. And then also getting a letter from uh, the supplier that they didn't have a prohibited treatment on those seeds prior to sending them to us. Depending on your operation, this can either be a really short list or a really long list of inputs. Um, if you're a produce grower, you might have a few more pest control substances um, that you're using to, to keep bugs off your, your produce. Um, typically in uh, grain operations, we're primarily gonna be looking at um, inoculants for legumes. Do you, uh, and, and the other one will be typically uh, insecto or another diatomaceous earth for um, uh, control of insects in grain storage and bins. Do you have any other materials that you commonly use, Doug, in grain operations? No, we, we tend to avoid them. Uh, the inoculants and the, uh, the diatomaceous earth grain treatment are I'm pretty sure the only thing we've ever had on our OSP. Yep, and that's, that's most common. Um, I think, Judy, you could probably speak to a few of the other uh, probably pesticides that would be used in, in organic context for your vegetables. Well, uh, we don't use a, a lot. Um, maybe every seventh year, I find that we need Dipel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it depends what grows near you. We happen to be in a canola growing region, so we do have a lot of pressure in the brassica family of insects. Absolutely. Um, since canola has become popular. Um, and occasionally, I think maybe every fifth or sixth year in one spot, we use a neem oil. And so make, we're, oh, pretty, yes. we're pretty careful. The greenhouses, we release ladybugs. Fantastic. And that is, and that is exactly sort of the goal is that we have a, uh, a system that has been maximized ecologically and so that it's able to take care of, take care of the problems sort of as an ecosystem um, with materials used secondarily. Um, on this list, we just want to make sure that any material we're going to use has been identified and approved by our certifier. Again, this is going to be a real, one of the few really hard lines in organics that if we put a prohibited material on our crops or on our land, it starts that transition process completely over. And so if we have a, a prohibited material that was accidentally applied because we didn't necessarily get approval or we didn't check with the certifier before applying it, that will completely kick the land out of organics for at least three years. Um, so making sure that we rely on the certifiers heavily just to get that approval is gonna be um, your, your path to peace of mind. Um, natural resource and biodiversity is an underfilled out section on the OSP. And I really wanna encourage everyone to try to take some more time and really consider this. Um, it's a growing point of interest from the National Organic Program. How are organic farms managing their, um, their natural resources, wildlife, um, soil conservation? And so when we go through, there's a lot of options. If you're involved with the NRCS, you're probably going to have a lot of this already articulated in different plans and feel free to include those plans with your OSP. Um, it's gonna give us a really good idea of what uh, conservation you're conducting on the farm. Um, with the 
with the check boxes, we're really just looking for what are all of the different things that you've done um, on a really, uh, on a fairly consistent basis. So I'd say, you know, within the last three years, have you done any of these practices and include them? And then we can talk about them during the inspection. But anything from cover crops, which are really common just in a, in a cropping scenario, but um, historic shelter belts, windbreaks, very common across, you know, most of, most of Montana. Um, any sort of uh, conservation farming, like contour farming, um, avoiding highly erodible land, strip cropping, conservation tillage, all of these are practices that I commonly see as an inspector. And often they don't get called out on this sheet, but they are being done. So give yourself credit um, and try to identify all of the practices you do perform um, in this section. Uh, nutrient cycling, we're really just looking for how are you maintaining the soil fertility and what are you doing to not leach uh, any, any excess nutrients. M nutrient leaching isn't as common in Montana just because we're so dry. And so there's not a lot of runoff typically in, in organic systems, but noting what you do do, so cover crops, crop rotation. Um, if you have catch crops around the edges of fields and preventing um, uh, runoff into streams, that's often a, a really great point of interest for us is how are you protecting your waterways and your wetlands. Um, maintaining crop residue, it seems kind of simple, but if you're leaving a lot of crop residue on that uh, field surface, you're, you're functionally performing a lot of different um, conservation activities like uh, moisture retention and, uh, and building that organic matter in the soil. Um, running over your biological and ecological diversity, I think um, I would love, love Doug to talk about sort of how he does this. I think he does a really great job um, in, in just being a really observant farmer about what are the, um, the activities of wildlife on your farm and, and what are you doing to enhance and protect those, those respective um, groups of wildlife. Would you like to speak to that at all, Doug? Sure, thanks, Nate. Um, appreciate the compliment. We, we do make a, make a point of inviting nature into our farm uh, structurally and uh, you know, it starts with, with just the layout of the fields, but uh, what you're speaking to it about observation, we encourage, uh, try to ourselves and encourage all of our um, uh, team members, you know, interns, uh, apprentices, uh, full-time staff, all of those to, to be alert to the, um, the presence of wildlife. And uh, it is an indicator to me of a functioning biological system. Uh, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, large animals or the, the microscopic and everything in between, uh, the more the better. And uh, we, we just, we feel like that that's part of a functioning uh, farm. And uh, we, we try to try to note it whenever we can and encourage it as, as much as we can. And I think a lot of folks are doing, doing things they don't claim credit for. So trying to trying to read through this list and, um, and, and check those boxes um, and see how we could do kind of, you know, a, a mass balance that your farming practices, um, to Doug's point, are, you, are, you, are your farming practices being friendly to nature or are they crowding nature out? And I think on the whole, the thing I love about organics is that on the whole, it does invite nature in. Um, it by default increases pollinator activity, increases the nectar flow of different ecosystems. Um, and so noting that as best you can and, and, for, and highlighting that is, is a, a great opportunity to have a discussion with your inspector about the practices you are doing right. Um, reducing the spread and impact of invasive species. Uh, lots of times I think a big, it's sort of an interesting conflict in organics, but most producers, I would say, use weed-free seed. Um, they're going to be using uh, certified seed. Mostly that certified seed is not going to be organic. And so that's a, a funny, a funny contention. Um, but ultimately, making sure that organics doesn't become a weedy mess in your fields um, is going to be good for you, but also good for everyone around you. And so we, when we see really intense weed pressures, we will cite that as an issue of concern and potentially non-compliance. Um, and so like Doug was saying, we do have a lot of tools in the toolbox. Um, we've got a lot of tillage tools with a good crop rotation. It's not um, impossible to really uh, farm very clean fields. 
Um, and so when we're considering how we reduce the spread and impact of invasive species, considering all of our different toolboxes and tools in the toolbox are gonna to be a, an important part of this, this part of the OSP. Um, supporting wildlife during the production season. Um, if we, most organic farms are going to have uh, buffers on the whole. And so I love to see folks using those buffers as a way to enhance wildlife habitat. Um, some folks really want to farm every inch inside their fences. Um, I think that there is uh, somewhat of a better use for that, that uh, space and time. Um, and so if you're able to, you know, plant your buffers with pollinator friendly crops, leaving your buffers standing if you can for ground nesting birds, um, things like that, uh, we want to try to highlight that and identify what are those practices so that again, we're inviting nature and at least not, uh, not crowding nature out. Um, restoring and protecting uh, natural areas. Um, of course, with our tillage, we wanna make sure that we're doing erosion prevention, trying to crop in a way that maintains our soil structure, um, but also highlighting if you have parts of your farm that you don't farm, that's an important component to identifying how we're we're protecting nature um, in our organic cropping plants. Um, I'll call out Doug one more time, just because um, I've I've been to his place and I think he does he manages a really big operation really well. And so I would say, could you talk a little bit, Doug, about tracking your acres of wetland and and your other sort of natural areas? Yeah, sure. We um, we note on all of our um, our field summaries. Uh, all of the acres that, that we manage or have, have access to, and that includes rangeland that's not used and uh, wetlands, as you mentioned, and uh, you know CRP and all of these things uh, where, again, it gives nature a space to express herself and, and to help us uh, create a, a functioning ecosystem. So just you know, take credit for, for all that you have interaction with and do the best you can to, to encourage nature to, to exist there to your benefit. Absolutely. I think it's fun to sort of flip the, the, the perspective on non-croppable acres as points of conservation. And so if you can't farm a field uh, given rocks or, or topography, um, seeing that as a contribution to your, your natural resources um, credit. I think is a, a fun a fun way to look at it. Um, water resources a little bit less common, but if we do have irrigated land, that's going to be something that we want to take into consideration. Um, how are you maintaining the water resources and not uh, potentially contaminating the crops? Um, noting the sources of irrigation, if it's a well, if we're coming off of a, an on-site lake or pond, um, where I'm at, it's mostly all ditch irrigation. So we also have to consider, are those ditches treated with anything? Um, and making sure that we don't have uh, contamination from that, that ditch treatment. Noting if we use the irrigation system to apply anything, fertigation. Um, and then if we're going to be having livestock on site, we also wanna make sure that the livestock themselves aren't leading to degradation. This is typically just good land management. And so I don't think this surprises anyone, but identifying ways that we make sure we don't have uh, a concentrated area that becomes um, potentially a point of runoff for nutrients from sort of a feedlot type situation, making sure that we manage those confined animal areas. Um, and then also identifying uh, that we're protecting the overall plant ecology, that we're not overgrazing um, and, and letting weeds uh, become more impactful. As uh, Judy had mentioned controlling invasive species. Uh, if we uh, release ladybugs into a field, we're going to realize um, some biological control methods. So if you do any of those practices, definitely claiming credit for them is gonna um, improve and enrich the entire inspection and, and help that inspection report. Weed management is always a point of discussion at every single farm. I asked the question, you know, right off the bat, what are your, your most troublesome weeds and how are you um, effectively managing them? Um, and so trying to really dive into what are all of the tools you use in your toolbox? There's a lot of options in this OSP. Um, these are just a few that might be commonly used. Um, if you're in a, uh, a produce operation, you might be using more things like, um, Soap-based, um, other herbicides, 
Um, if you're using a, uh, a crimper roller, you might have some smother crops, a um, lot of different things. I sometimes use pre-irrigation to get one more flush of weeds on my irrigated ground, um, but try to go through these lists thoroughly and identify if any of your practices um, uh, correspond to those check boxes. Monitoring practices, we do like to see that there's um, some monitoring going on that you're not surprised when we both get out to the field and there's giant thistle patches everywhere. Um, I'd like you to know about that before I know about that and have a, a plan to accurately monitor. Um, making sure that we just keep up again on how often do we monitor, what way do we monitor, what records do we actually keep. It might be pictures in our phone that are date stamped, it might be handwritten journal entries, anything, um, any record is allowed in organics. Um, we just want to make sure that it accurately captures um, what we're looking at as far as monitoring. Pest management, a little bit less common. We, uh, we don't suffer from too many pests, but I know grasshoppers were a really big problem this year. Um, sawflies are perennially kind of a, a pressure that we deal with. Um, so making sure that we identify what are we doing to actively and, and and proactively manage those pests and, and keep those pests suppressed. Again, diseases, if we have any sort of rust, if we're running into any sort of blights on our barleys, um, any other uh, uh, disease or, or pressures on our produce crops, um, we want to be looking at what are we doing. If you say, you have um, fusarium head blight on your, on your cereals year after year, and I as an inspector see you growing cereals year after year. I'm going to have a lot less sympathy for your plight um, if I don't see you actively trying to, to manage those. And so if there's um, all of these tools in the toolbox, we wanna see folks really trying to use those all um, and, and build a robust system, which ultimately just leaves less room for that sort of disease pressure buildup. Um, and so when we're talking about crop rotation, it is both just good business and good, um, good agronomy to manage your, your fields effectively with crop rotation, but it is also a, a mandate in the standards for the very reason that we, by rotating our crops, um, can prevent buildups of pests and weed pressures. And we can make it so that we are proactively minimizing the chance for outbreaks, which affect not only us, but possibly neighbors and other fields around us. Um, and so in dryland Montana, these diseases are a little bit easier to control. They increase in presence when you have irrigation involved, but um, things that we definitely want to be actually monitoring for and making sure that we're not setting ourselves up since we don't have any big hammers like a fungicide to deal with an outbreak. We want to make sure we're proactively managing them. If you have split and parallel production, it's going to be something that we're going to look quite closely at. Um, we want to make sure that if you're raising um, wheat in parallel, so you have organic and conventional wheat, that you have an SOP and practices in place that can make it uh, pretty clear and with, with a good level of confidence, we can assess that there's not potentially contamination either from your inputs, your herbicides, your, your uh, pest controls in your bins. We want to make sure that none of that is going to potentially contaminate the crop, but we also want to make sure via our audits and our, our examination of the farm that there's no substitution of conventional crops going into the organic crops. Um, and so that's why those pesky audits where we have you pull out all of your records um, and run through years worth of production, that's what those are for, is making sure that if we do, especially in a split and parallel operation, if we do have conventional and organic being produced side by side, that we can with confidence show that we're not at risk of contaminating. So it's neat that uh, I really like that we can do split and parallel production because I think it helps folks get started in organics um, and they don't have to take the whole operation, but it does require more record keeping and more attention to detail. Harvest is going to be fairly consistent. We just want to make sure that your machinery is not going to pose a risk to your crops. So how do you clean out your machinery? If you're using custom harvesters or custom trucks, um, how are you tracking and recording that that machinery is being uh, kept clean and not itself posing a risk to the uh, organic integrity of the crops? So a few check boxes, also some options to describe um, what you're doing. So in my case, all of my equipment is dedicated to organic. So I don't have, um, I don't use custom operators and I don't do any custom work for conventional farms. 
Um, and so that makes it a little bit easier. Um, if you're using, uh, I do all alternatively though, um, use a lot of custom trucks to ship grain out to customers. Typically that is handled by the customers, but if you're managing it, um, then you wanna make sure you're getting clean truck affidavits, um, stating that that transport unit was cleaned prior to loading your organic grain. Um, so going through this, just noting all of your practices, some of it might be not applicable. Um, uh, if you require a purge, then we want to know where does that purge go? So if you're running 30 bushels of grain through your combine as a may to clean the combine, and by purge, we mean you're going to send organic grain through that combine, um, treat it as conventional, get rid of it as conventional, and then start um, uh, harvesting the rest of your organics. Um, we want you to keep track of that, keep good, keep good detailed records. Storage, we just want you to identify what storage units are you going to be using. It might be um, uh, space in a shed in the uh, case of produce, um, typically bins or just stackyards for hay and grain. Um, what are the locations? What are the names of the storage units? And what um, are they dedicated to organic if they're not? Making sure that you keep clean out records um, of those storage units to show that they weren't potentially contaminated by previous crops or by previous materials. Packing more um, applicable on the produce side, if we're doing some packing, or if you're toting grain off for a particular buyer, um, just noting how you're um, protecting that in the packing process and that the packing process doesn't pose any threat. Um, whoops. Transport is gonna be something that we're going to wanna always uh, fill out with careful attention, typically, uh, almost across the board, folks use um, custom transport. So if you're shipping grain across the country, um, there's gonna be some sort of hired uh, tractor involved and trailer. And so just making sure that we get those clean equipment affidavits or perform the clean outs ourselves of those, those transport units, that's gonna be critical for the inspector to, to verify that crop was protected during transport. And then record keeping. So this is a way to also summarize again, we've noted it throughout the, um, the different modules, but noting what uh, records do you keep? In what form do you keep them? And, and really focusing on everything. Um, a big one is that all of your organic records need to be maintained for five years. And so don't throw them out after your inspection. Even though it might be feel celebratory that you got through it, you got your certificate, now all those records can go. Make sure you hold on to everything for five years. I would say just hold on to everything forever, but at least five years. It's really, I think it's a, a critical component and a really important way. If there's ever an investigation of a supply chain fraud, lots of times we'll go several years back to verify um, compliance and that um, a given operation wasn't um, involved in fraud. And so that five years is, is pretty important um, for making sure that if there is any sort of supply chain investigation, um, we can conduct that and have all the records necessary. Lot numbers, um, I think there's, we can pretty much use a, a consistent lot numbering style. I can't quite remember what Doug's is, but the one that I really like is that you're going to, identify the year of your crop, you're going to find what your crop is, um, and then you're going to identify the storage unit and the load out of the storage unit. And so what we mean by that is when you go to sell a crop, we want you to identify it with something that allows us to trace it back. And so when you're looking at a lot numbering system, my goal is to ideally be able to take that lot numbering system on the sale and trace that crop back to the field. Um, if you're a grain producer or a hay producer, lots of times you're aggregating different fields in bins or um, stackyards. Um, if you're a produce grower, I think it's somewhat a little bit easier to, um, to know which fields you harvested because that uh, the harvest to sale um, period is a lot shorter. You're gonna be selling fresh produce a lot of the times. But coming up with a system that allows you to trace that crop back from sale back to seed um, is gonna be a foundational component um, to that, that auditability of the organic system. 
noting any other internal audits you conduct. Um, and then of course, we just need to make sure that we can trace all of your crops from sale back to seed and that we can do an, a mass balance whereby we look at um, the amount of acres you're certified to grow and how much you actually sold off of those acres and make sure that that is uh, justifiable. If you do do any record keeping, uh, or sorry, I hope you do record keeping. If you do do any labeling, um, there's very specific uses of the organic seal that we have to consider. Um, as a grain farmer, I don't do any labeling. It's all sold bulk, usually in, in loose in uh, hopper trailers. But if you do pack and sell under a brand um, and you wanna use the organic seal, you have, just wanna make sure that you submit those labels to uh, your certifier prior to sending them to the marketplace so that they're approved. Um, it can be a real headache to have to pull a bunch of product back off the shelf if it's mislabeled with the organic seal incorrectly used. Prior to getting them printed. Or prior to getting, exactly, prior to getting them printed. Yes, it's very expensive to have a bunch of labels you can't use or you have to amend. So absolutely. All right. Well, I think we are one minute ahead of schedule. Um, and does anyone have any questions? I realize that is, that is the whole crop OSP that we went through. Um, and so if there's anything on that that you still have questions, um, shout them out now or feel free to email me as you as you work through your system. Yeah, just a note too. Um, I'm willing to stick around so long as everyone has um, the time to do so and has questions to ask. Yeah. Seems like lunchtime, it looks like. Yeah, no, it's, if it's <laughs> Again, uh, operation specific questions are really good. I have a question, uh, Nathaniel. Which uh, which do you which which component of the, of the farm do you see? Do you think uh, uh, farmers have more difficulties or, or or challenging? So, what's the most challenging part of the of the whole process, from based on your experience? From the filling out the OSP, I would say it's materials making sure that we get all materials approved prior to their use. Labeling, if we're doing that, that can often be quite a headache. Um, and, I, and I see a lot of farmers struggle with the amount of paperwork it takes to amend a mislabeled um, a ser series of products sold. Um, but inputs, labeling, and seeds, those are sort of the three fundamental ones that cause a lot of headache. And if I could just have folks focus on those most heavily, it would be a lot, um, a lot easier making sure that we just take with due diligence this, the right steps to um, receiving the proper approval and getting the respective information on the seeds. Um, that's gonna be saving you a ton of time and headaches when it comes time for inspection process and make it show that your, um, your inspection can occur. Um, we typically don't do inspections until all of the paperwork has been received on the whole. Um, and so uh, there, the more delayed we are in getting that information, the more delayed we are in getting the inspection. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Any more questions? Mm. Well, I, 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 I think you, you were right. Yeah, lunch, it, it's, it's lunchtime and, <clears throat> and it was an, definitely a, a very, an, an exciting meeting and I think we, we learned a lot incredible how, how many uh, topics we, we could um, explore here in, in just 90 minutes so I, I would say from from my part let's let's end it here and, and maybe uh, uh, thanks a lot of obviously everybody for attending and, and Nathaniel for this excellent presentation and I don't know whether uh, Jamie wants to share some final words with us uh, thanks, Roland. Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, another note that we do have a session on accessing federal working lens programs this afternoon at four. If you don't have an invitation to that, party, please just let me know. And so you've just been participating in Organic University. The bulk of our conference actually starts tomorrow um, at nine o'clock. So yeah. if you don't have those invitations, please, again, let me know. So thank you for joining us. And I hope you all have a good day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank and thank you. you. Thank you, Doug and Judy. Doug and Judy. Thank you, everyone. Feel free to reach out if anyone has further questions we can be helpful with. Concur. Thank you. All right. Take care.